In a few words, can I someone the breeder? It's pretty hard. Oh, a man who did his best. Yes, he did. And was often right. Not always, though. <laughs> Douglas Canfield, who was a great army man, had, good, had <laughs> well, he, he knew how he wanted the shot. Uh, he wanted the people to stand by him. The brigadier was there, uh, colonel at that time, and all the other people. And I, uh, Douglas, we had to rush. Obviously, you always have to rush. And Douglas had me behind a mortar. Now, it's amazing that Douglas got that wrong. Because if I stand behind a mortar and it fires, that's the end of me. So I was early on in my days in Doc 2, knew about Douglas, who knows he to sort of get shrink a bit if he got sort of uptight about something. But I said, Douglas, no, you cannot have me here. You better do something else with your cameras because I'm not standing behind a mortar and getting the whole of myself shot off. So uh, I was always cautious about physical injury. Well, I was a little more reckless because I was younger and I wanted to do my own stunts. And I did all of them except the one where the Jeep went over the cliff and exploded. Um, I had tried to do it originally, but my boot had caught between the brake and the accelerator. And the stuntman, one of the Havoc boys, had said, we, you know, we think we ought to get a real stuntman in there. But I enjoyed doing stunts because I found them easy, because I didn't mind getting hurt. Like in The Demons, just a quickest story, you know, when we did the fight scene in The, in the Devil, in The... Uh, no one likes being hurt, be it emotionally or physically, John. Well, I don't know. I don't, I don't, there's some people that do, you know. Well, they don't, Strange rather, people. Rather don't mind being hurt. That's what I thought I'd said. Oh, I'll, I'll have a you know, go, I mean, but I also know I've got sense, and that's why we have, with inequity, of course, we have stunt men, or we have a stunt register, and we have a stunt um, whole advisors. But that's what they're there for, to know that if a certain actor can't do a certain thing for any reason, that's why they're there. And they beg us not to try and do silly things that we can't do. And by God, they're right. And that's why they're well paid. Yeah, but I mean, in this instant, I had the fight when I had, and, and he hit me up over on the bar, and I jumped up on the bar. And what I'm saying is there was an ashtray there that nobody would seen. So because I was 14 stone then, I fell down on the ashtray, and it really hurt my spine. And the interesting thing is, whoever directed the demons said, you did awfully well in that scene, John Christopher Barry. And it was because I hurt myself that the scene looked so good. Maybe that's why I was trying I to think see. one of the scenes from Inferno that I didn't like, well, I said earlier, was one of my favorite stories, was the punch-up I had with Derek Newark. That looked, I still think, awful. Now, we sort of did a mock fight, which I don't think looked very good, but for one reason or another, I had to do it myself. I, I didn't mind. I'm, I was, put it this way, I was prepared to have a go because I knew I could, because someone maybe is looking after me. I had a go, but in the end, it probably would have been better done, but they couldn't get a stunt double with an eye patch and a thing down his cheek, which I had all that. Some of these ladies and gentlemen may not know, those are the days when I had to come out with impossible lines to the brigadier, and I had to literally say to the camera, someone else uh, was playing my captain, Robert Sidaway, and his name was Jimmy, and I had to get this RT, whatever, microphone, uh, and say, Jimmy, I want you to get on my chopper and tell Benton to lay on a jeep. <laughs> now think about it. And I did it, and I didn't break up. And, but what a line that was written. And the what end of line, line is, I actually went out and laid on the jeep when you came out. Which was... <laughs> my only line I made up was the Green Death, which that lady over there liked, thank you, madam. And I made up the Here, Kitty, Kitty, Kitty. Uh, which, well, I mean, it figured, you know, I said, yeah, I made that up. I thought it was a perfect line for the... Oh. Um, okay. <laughs> Any more questions? This is rather enjoyable. The... It's very Thank enjoyable, you. indeed. <clears throat> are you all cooler now? And are we boring you? No. Are you sure? Okay. Some... Okay, then, a few more questions. Okay, why not? It's extraordinary, and his uh, granddaughter has just published a book about William Hart, which you may know about. And she asked me originally, because she was, one year she was on the Council of Equity, and uh, she asked me for my memories, and I told her. And I found him, it was towards the end, and he wasn't too well, and he was a bit tetchy, but he happened to like me. But the first memory I have of William Hartnell is giving me the worst advice that he, anyone has given me. He said to me, no, 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 you don't want that agent. I was with a surname, no, you don't want that agent. You join Terry Carney, who was his uh, 
son-in-law. Yeah, I think that's right. And um, so I did, because Terry Carney, the agent, came around and said, I'm shopping, would you like? I said, oh, yes, it sounds very good. I didn't work for one year. So I went back to the previous agent. And apart from that, Bill liked me, but um, per certain people he didn't like, he could be pretty short with, and um, he was a touch bigoted. A good way of putting it, I think. Oh, uh, you mean about Jean Marsh? Well, it was good to see her. Um, I had to remind her that we'd met on other sides and she'd killed me off. Uh, no, she didn't kill me off in Battlefield. Um, I think we had what was called a standoff or something like that. Uh, no, it's fun to see Jean again. She's a um, super actress, very funny, very funny lady, very good. Do you know she never watches, apparently she never watches Doctor Who, well, or doesn't watch much television. That's all right, it's up to her. But uh, I wasn't worried. I wasn't worried. Thank you. I can tell you what I would have done. No, I don't need water. Where's my pint? Oh, pint. Oh, you're, you're such a Puritan. Since he's been to America, he's such a Puritan. Dear, oh dear. No, I never did drink, Nick, you know that. My father was a workaholic, actually. You mentioned work, he got drunk. Um, no, I would have been on a cruise with Oliver North this weekend, just to let you know. I'm not saying that to impress you, but I was booked um, when Alex phoned me up for this. Um, Oliver North, who's got to be one of the most crooked soldiers I've ever met, they do cruise lines in America, and they wanted me to go along on it. And, uh, but I chose to come here just in case Doctor Who didn't take off. And I'd rather be here than on a cruise with Oliver North. <laughs> You're a very good judge indeed. <laughs> Oliver North, strange company you keep. Yes, uh, well, no, I mean, it's not my company, but it would have been, uh, it would have been fascinating. Would have been interesting, yes, indeed. But they're all very crooked over there. That's not a good place to live in terms of politics. Um, all right, well... Uh, all money. They all, uh, they like money too much. Never mind, they can't help it. <laughs> Well, you know what they say, if you want to know what God thinks of people with money, you look at who he's given it to. <laughs> oh, a laugh, thank you. Um, yes, my gentleman. Where have you been all my life? The gentleman <laughs> asked what it was like when you preempted the fact that we were going to have that bitch. I'm a Margaret Thatcher. As, <laughs> as a, oh, that one, you mean, oh, when I was on the uh, line, yes. Well, originally, Douglas Canfield had thought that uh, a possible prime minister could be a woman. At that time, he had in his mind, he said, well, it could have been Shirley Williams. I wish it had, but uh, I suppose the rest is history. I think the Brigadier, he disliked politicians enormously. He disliked them because they are renowned liars and fibbers. And um, that's why the Brigadier didn't like me. He didn't trust them. He thought they were self-seeking. And for the Brigadier to have a woman Prime Minister would be very difficult because the Brigadier, as you know, was rather shy about women, I think. He, um, he was married, he was fine, but he treated all the companions, Miss So-and-so, Miss So-and-so. He, he was a little uncertain, possibly, of women. And to have a woman Prime Minister would have been almost impossible for him. So, um, <laughs> thank you very much. So, um, the, uh, then, of course, fiction became fact. Well, the balmy baroness is now in the House of Lords. Uh, I think I better shut up because I have such strong feelings about this because I do think certain things in this country have been wrecked by the temptation for people to be greedy, to not care about other people. apologies for that. I mean, all, all the sort of beliefs I had. Uh, I mean, I remember I had a lady friend from America once and I rang her up about something and uh, this lady friend who I get on well with now, uh, she, I said, you know, it's terrible. In, in my Binsby Park, which is stationed near where I live in North London, I said, now I see women with children begging and I'm shattered by this. And being an American lady with great respect to her, she said, well, what do you care? You're all right. And I hung up on her, and we had a hell of a non-row. We did, we did meet again. But um, I think maybe I probably said enough, because this is supposed to be more of a fun time. But I think that lady has a lot to answer for.
friend of mine once said that he wanted to go into politics, and I said, you know, he had half a mind to go into politics, and I said, well, that's all you really need. And, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Five minutes. We've got five minutes, ladies and gentlemen. Just enough time for Nick to drink his lager. Um, oh, no, yes. I should take longer than that. Good, getting there at last. Well, because I don't believe in Father Christmas anymore, either. I mean, you know, when I was four years old, my dad gave me one present, and I opened it up, and it was an empty shoebox. And I said, what is that? He said, it's an action man deserter. Shut up. <laughs> no, it does. It can disturb you. And even this year, I only had two, two, two presents from my family. I had a short sleeve shirt and a pair of cufflinks. It was the point. <laughs> okay, one more intelligent question. You've been ever... Yes, sir. Any question you like. How do you feel about act, um, acting with special effects, uh, against special effects, where you can't see anyone there? You get used to it, is the answer. You have to imagine it. You have to keep in your mind that is that particular alien or monster you're fighting, there's nothing there at all. You have to keep going in your mind all the time that there is a giant maggot, a yeti, a cyber or whatever. And even if there's nothing there at all, you have to imagine it. All you have to do though is, as the brigadier, this is a story against myself and they're always the best. Douglas Campbell used to say to me, Nick, will you fire that pistol as though you meant it? Well of course, Dougie always thought I was, you know, natural for this part. Now, as you may or may not know, I did my national service to the army. I was only a private, because I had no serious ambitions to be a soldier. I already wanted to be an actor. And so, the army, in their unwisdom, I did 18 months national service, and they forgot to teach me how to fire a rifle. <laughs> Thank God I didn't go to Korea, otherwise that might have been the end of everyone. So that's why um, doctors had to remind me all the time to sort of fire the pistol as though I meant it. I guess I'm such a non-violent guy anyway. Um, I wouldn't like to do it very much, but uh, you, you, you must. So doctors used to nag me and I used to do my best. You see, one of the things that you know, people that aren't actors, you know, obviously you don't get to know, is the, the gloriousness of being in a show like that. You know, when we used to get off at the Acton rehearsal rooms, you know, in Acton, in London, and you'd see people like, when, when they were making The Last of the Mohawks, you'd see the John Abenary walking in to do that. You'd see the, the people doing Are You Being Served? We used to have the Young Generation dancers in the next room to us. Then there was Monty Python down the road. It was an amazing situation in the 60s and 70s. Of the Morgan and Wise came in, I went into their studio to see what they were doing, and I was wearing, I think it was the, um, I think it was the Green Death story, and I was wearing, or, or was it indeed, the demons, where I had to be in the immaculate evening dress or something. Oh, the demons, yes. And I went in to the studio to see Morecambe and Wise, and Morecambe came straight up to me, not on the stiff shirt, say, anyone there? <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. I was in Top of the Pops once, when I was married to a lady from Salisbury, and I got Cliff Richards to speak to my wife on the phone, which I thought was rather nice. He was saying, yeah, you know, would you say hello to my wife? He said, why should I? No. Um, but that, you know, you get some wonderful moments, and... Um, Oh, we've got one more nice question at the back, so loud as you can. Can you describe your phantom, Brigadier's phantom wife, Fiona? Can I describe Fiona? Or the Brigadier's first wife? Yes, I can describe Fiona. She was, um, I expect, moneyed. Fairly upper class, I would think. Uh, but she got very bored with the Brigadier, who went round the world all the time with this strange person called the Doctor. And she got bored, and so she left him and went to someone else. The Brigadier was heartbroken, and then he thought, oh well, never mind, I did have that wonderful weekend in Brighton with Doris. And so he thought, you know, after a time, after he'd healed, you know, after this wife leaving him, who he loved, and uh, he said, well, Doris, how about it, old girl? Probably, the Brigadier said. And so Doris probably presumably said yes. Um, I think the Brigadier probably had uh, quite a good go in the handshake as well. He might have had some money around, I think because that place in Battlefield looked rather good. And of course, in downtime, as you know, uh, Beverly, who played my daughter, who's a smashing actress, uh, she was Fiona's child. She was my daughter by my first wife. But I described Fiona as um, long-suffering, but eventually got very fed up with her husband, husband being away all the time. Kept on leaving her, because he felt he had to, it was his duty. So she got fed up and left him, which, and she probably had a point. Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, having ruined Nick's panel altogether, we now have to wind this up, and we are re waiting for some people who are on the other side of the camera, so would you put your hands together for my wonderful brigadier, Mr. Nicholas Courtney?